introduction and thanks to the whole uh, team at Pint of Science for organizing that. It's a, it's a great uh, idea indeed. So my talk, in fact, uh, given that uh, the time constraint and all that, I decided to focus on the first part, which is the astronomical part, which is probably what you know best. And I will, uh, but if you want at the end, we can spend a bit more time on, uh, on the particle physics part of it, which I considerably reduced for uh, uh, lack of time. So I'm going to talk about the dark side of the universe. And you know that when you look at the, uh, the uh, a starry night, when you look at the sky and you see lots of objects, it seems that there is so much out there. But in fact, what we have realized now is that what we see, all those stars, galaxies, uh, whatever objects that we see in the, in the, in the sky, this only, is one tiny part of what is there inside the, the universe. In fact, what we see, which, which is visible matter, only account for 5% of the content of the universe. Today, we know that dark matter, a type of matter that does not emit light, account for 27% account for of the content of the universe. And dark energy, so a type of energy, which is quite mysterious. It's not dark, but because we had dark matter, dark energy came later. By analogy, they put the name of dark energy. And that would make up 68% of the content of the universe. So we know very, very little. All the stars, all the galaxies, everything we see around us is only 5% of what is out there. So what I'm going to do tonight I show you some, some of the proofs of the existence of dark matter, trying to convince you that it's true, it's real. And then briefly at the end, review how one can hope to catch dark matter particles. And that was the job that, uh, as a particle physicist, I had uh, at CERN. That was great. So proof of the existence. First of all, I look at uh, dark energy. That's the biggest part of the whole uh, content of the universe, but that's the one where we know uh, the least. Imagine that two distant galaxies, two or three, that are shown here in the universe. So what we show here is like the fabric of the universe. And you know that the universe is in expansion. So these two, I should show them with uh, the mouse instead of my finger. So you see that those two uh, galaxies, because they are part of the universe. If, because the universe is in expansion, they are receding from each other. They're moving with respect uh, from one to the other. But what has been observed fairly recently, I think it was in 1998 by three uh, American astronomers, was that not only these, uh, these galaxies were receding from each other, but that the this was going in accelerating. So it meant that, it's, think of the universe as a balloon. If I was to blow the balloon, I, I, I put two dots on my balloons and I'm uh, blowing my balloon. I, I couldn't find the balloons. I, normally I have one, I couldn't find one. So if I blow the balloon, then you will see the two points moving away from each other. But now these astronomers have realized that in fact, those uh, points are uh, be uh, moving away from each other, but this is going in accelerating. You know that if you're on your bicycle or walking or running or in a car, if you want to accelerate, you need to give energy. So the big question is, what is accelerating the expansion of the universe? So now we see that not only the, the universe is expanding, but this expansion is going in accelerating. And so, to accelerate the expansion of the universe, it's easy to understand that we need an awful lot of energy. And this is what we now call dark energy. And there is not much more that is known about dark energy, but that's just to give you an idea where this uh, term comes about. What I'm mostly going to talk about now is dark matter. Dark matter was first postulated by a Swiss astronomer. His name is uh, Fritz Zwicky. Apparently, the guy was a real uh, nut bar, a crazy guy. But he had all sorts of uh, crazy ideas. But one thing that he had, that he looked at, was looking at a spiral galaxy. So it's 
a galaxy that is uh, spinning and all the stars uh, within it are spinning around it. He was looking at that and thinking, what is maintaining all of those uh, stars within uh, the galaxy? And you know that if you are spinning like on a merry-go-round, you need to hold yourself or you'll be ejected. So the question that uh, Zwicky had was, how, what is holding all the stars within the galaxy? Because he was saying that they were spinning really fast. How come these stars were not simply ejected? Here, the kids are holding themselves to the merry-go-round, so they are not uh, ejected. But his question was, what is generating the gravitational force needed to maintain these galaxies together? Because it was clear the force that is holding those stars within the galaxy is provided by a gravitational field which comes from having a lot of matter in the galaxy. So what he tried to do was to calculate how much matter was there in a galaxy. So he counted how many stars he saw, he knew roughly what was the mass of one star, and then he came up with some idea of how big was uh, this galaxy. But he realized that there was way not enough matter within the galaxy to provide the gravitational force strong enough to hold all the stars within the galaxy. And there he said, well, there must be some sort of uh, dunkly materie, some dark matter that emits a gravitational field, but doesn't emit light. So he postulated that in fact, it, it was filled with a lot of a mysterious type of matter, which he called dark matter, which would provide the gravitational force needed to maintain the galaxies together. He had no idea, and we still don't know, what this matter is, but it explained why the galaxies were holding together. And so he did his uh, calculations in 1933, and they were really rough uh, calculations, but it's only in 1970, so 40 years later, that Vera Rubin, an American astronomer who unfortunately died a few years ago, a great woman, she made uh, some uh, more, of, uh, sorry, on the slide is in French, I forgot to change that one. So the, the, he made some, she made some sort of calculation. She realized that all the, the stars in the galaxies were in fact rotating at the same speed, no matter how far away they were from the center. Whereas from Kepler's law, you would expect that the, the stars that are more, uh, are located away from the center their, um, their uh, rotational speed would be much less. But and that would be the case if all the matter was concentrated in the center of the galaxy. Then that would apply. Pauline, but, will you allow a question, Wilbrick? Yeah. I want just shoot it. Yeah, I have a question. What do you mean by the stars being ejected from the galaxy if there was no gravitation? Well, like just you cannot have something <laughs> spinning like this, take uh, anything like a, thank you, I have uh, something. Okay, uh, have a, uh, question. Just, just hold it like this. And if you don't hold the string, it's going to hit my face, but if you don't, if you don't hold it, you know, and it, it will just uh, leave, just like the kids on the very go round. That's there is the centripetal force and they will be ejected. I, I understand this, but I think my question is more, what if, they are being ejected, but it's really slow, and so we think they are not being ejected, but it just it happens like... Because, no? Will it, this be possible? No, it, they, they are held together by the okay. gravitational force. They are attracted by the, the, the quantity of matter that is in the galaxy. That's what is providing the gravitational force. Except that what is visible matter in the galaxy, stars uh, that emit light, it doesn't account for all the matter that is within the galaxy. Are you with me? Yeah. You don't seem like. It's just I'm that. about how can something be ejected so fast from a galaxy, but it has to. It's just look at the galaxy as if it was a merry-go-round. If the kids don't listen to their parents and don't hold themselves, they just fall. Yeah. But this will take some time, no? 
I don't know how fast it would take, but they would eventually, they, they would not be, the, the, the whole thing would disperse. It would not stay together. Okay? And so we will expect the same from the stars. They will be ejected so fast as well. I don't know how fast it will happen, but they would all disseminate and there would not be a grouping of stars in a galaxy, like in a spiral galaxy. That would not exist. It would not. If I may, maybe a comment. Yeah. If I may comment. So the, the stars maybe would go away of the galaxy very slowly, but also the galaxy has a lifespan of millions of years. So then the effect that you would see after millions of years of the creation of the galaxy would not be that, that compact galaxy. So even though they would go away very, very slowly, we would, we, we would watch galaxies with many different ages, sort of see that they wouldn't be held together after many, many, many years, if that's any helpful. Yes, I, I didn't have an idea how, how fast it would happen. So thanks for the clarification. So, all this to say, so, whoops, I have to come back here. Bonnet doesn't want to work. Okay, no more questions then. <laughs> Maybe here? Okay, so that worked. So, so the point is now we know, thanks to uh, Fritz Wicke and Vera Rubin, we know that there is dark, uh, mat um, dark, um, dark matter in the universe. Now, let's tr look at how we can better understand this question. So we need to look at what is a gravitational field. A gravitational field, uh, a field is something that simply modifies the properties of the space around it, the space around it. So imagine the space is like a sheet, a bed sheet. So I need the help of uh, two people, maybe uh, Found and Alban, you, you can help me. Imagine that you're holding uh, you have to stand up, both of you. Okay, please. Uh, Alban, you worry? Okay, so imagine that I give you a bed sheet, okay? And hold it very, very tight, pull on it, that's it. And hold it very tight. Now, if I was to use a ping pong ball and let it roll on the, on the sheet, uh, it's, it's just going to go on a straight line. That's exactly what light would do in an empty space. Light would move on a straight line, okay? So now we have an empty space, no matter on it. But now on my time space that you have, uh, space time that you have there, the bed sheet, I drop a big, heavy bowling ball. Okay, whoops, yeah, 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 keep, keep holding. So you see that uh, it's going to deform the surface of the bed sheet. Now, if I toss my ping pong ball, it will proceed and follow the surface of the of the sheet. And if it goes through too close to the massive object, it will simply fall into it. Okay, that would be a black hole. So near massive objects, the light will follow the curves of the deformed space. Okay, thank you very much. You can fold the, the sheet, put it away. That's good. So near massive objects, like uh, the sun, the light will follow the curves of the deformed space. It will no longer go on a straight line, but it will go uh, on a curved line. So that's what happened if you're looking at uh, the, star, uh, the sun that is there. And say that I want to observe a distant uh, star, which is located behind it. Whoops. Uh, Somehow, okay, the star is uh, under the title gravitational field here, so that's why we don't see it. But imagine that um, you have the star, oh, here it is. So you have the star here, and the light from the star is not going to proceed on a, on a straight line. Uh, I, again, I cannot use my finger. It's not going to go in a straight line like this towards the telescope, but instead it will follow the curvature of the space time around it. And eventually when it's moving away from the, the sun, the heavy object, it will keep going on on a straight line. And then it will reach this uh, telescope, which happens to be the Hubble telescope. So for the astronomers who are on board or using the image for, coming from, um, from it, then the light seemed to come from a displaced object. So 
they will think that the star that they're observing is not here, but rather there. So you see, when we look at, this, uh, at, the, at the stars in the sky, we don't see exact, their exact position because they are, when they, when they pass around heavy amount of matter, they're being uh, uh, modified. So it would be the same thing when light comes nearby a big blob of dark matter. Imagine that I have a big blob of dark matter here somewhere, and I'm an astronomer here, and I'm on the, on the right, and I want to observe a distant galaxy here. The light that comes from the galaxy goes in all sorts of direction, but when it comes around the dark matter, the big blob, big, huge amount of mass there, which have curved the lines of the space-time around it, then the light will curve around, and finally it will keep going on a straight line and reach the telescope. But for the observers, they see rays of light that seem to emerge from positions that are above or below the object that they are looking at, except for the, the rays that are coming straight in the middle here, those are not deflected. So you see an image in the center of the object that you're looking at, as well as one above, one uh, under. Okay, so you see a distortion of your image because of this blob of dark matter. But this happens in, tri in, in three dimensions. So not only above and below, but you will see also images all around it, like this. So when we observe an object which is placed beyond a big blob of dark matter, we don't see the object, uh, just the object itself here, but we see a ring of images around it. Those are called Einstein's ring. And here is a picture of such a, a ring that has been observed by the Hubble telescope. So instead of seeing the, the distant galaxy, we also see an image, uh, um, a ring of images of it all around it. If, it. if the three objects, the galaxy that you're observing, the blob of dark matter and the observer were all perfectly aligned, you would have a perfect ring here. Otherwise you just see little arcs of uh, light. But from that, we, astronomers can map the location of dark matter in the universe. So this is the technique called of gravitational lensing, and it allows us to map the location of dark matter. So with, with gravitational lensing, we can see that the light coming from distant objects do, doesn't give us a, 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 a fine point, but instead it gives us uh, some rings. Pauline, will you allow another question? Yeah. Philip, will you just ask yourself or shall I do it for you? Uh, no, you can just ask yourself. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for the great talk so far. Um, I was just wondering in this second, how, I mean, concerning this gravitational lensing, um, and unlike the picture you, you sh you've shown, maybe you can go back one slide. Yeah. Um, we. Yeah, we see, we see visible matter in the middle of the picture, right? And yeah. this visible matter, which might be heavy mass star or something or, or a galaxy, distorts this light. But in, in the effect you were addressing, uh, there would be nothing visible in the middle that causes this kind of ring-shaped distortion, exactly. right? The dark so, matter itself, you don't see it. Yes, yes. Here, right? We don't see, only see a distortion of the yes. light coming from this object. And this distortion tells us that this blob is there. That's all so, we get. Yeah, and my, my question was, how could you then tell the difference between dark matter and um, a black hole? Because both would not be visible or only indirectly visible. So how could you know if you see an effect like this, if the thing that you don't see in the middle is black matter or a black hole? I think it, uh, I'm not uh, an astronomer. Probably one of you will, uh, will know the, the right answer to that. Both of them, uh, black holes and dark matter, will produce deformations. But I think the fact that the dark matter is spread on a very large scale will give a type of distortion which is different from a point-like object 
like a black hole is usually very small. So I think that's the difference between the two. That the, the, the fact that the dark matter takes a lot of space, whereas the black holes is quite concentrated. And so the type of distortions will be different. That would be my guess. Could someone uh, confirm what I just said or if someone- I Would naively believe that if there's a dark hole in the middle in the way, which could cause the gravitational lensing, you wouldn't be able to see the thing in the middle as bright because the, the dark hole would actually take a lot of light itself in it, which, uh, which the dark matter will not do. Yeah, good point. Uh, uh, a black hole here would probably absorb some of the light that goes straight to it. So you wouldn't see so bright here. Yeah, okay. Yeah, but uh, just, just adding, if, if I may, um, the, the example of M87 showed exactly that, didn't it? It showed a lot of light, um, visible light around the... So Okay, so I'm, I'm sorry, if I may introduce, I'm the black hole expert here, I guess. Um, so the scale of which you looked at M87 would be like sub, 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 sub pixel on a picture like that. So kind of like the taking away would happen. Black holes are so much smaller than anything else. Stay for the later talk by me. Uh, but what Pauline said is absolutely right, right? The distribution would be so different. I think that you can, you could take the difference because the, if you would squeeze kind of a whole galaxy into a black hole, it would be something kind of like the size of the solar system, which is like a grain of salt, a grain of salt compared to the whole earth or something like that. Yeah. Sorry, sorry for interrupting. No, 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 no. Okay, so we have the answer. Okay, so I'll move on. And I'm sure we could, uh, we could, uh, you could uh, split hair a lot on the stuff. Let's let's stay on the fairly general level, and then at the end, I'll take the more detailed question. Okay. All right. So, gravitational lensing, gravitational lensing allows us to map where do we have dark matter in the universe. Okay. So now we have seen, thanks to Zwicky and Vera Rubin, that there is dark matter. And now we see that we can also uh, realize that it is there thanks to gravitational lensing. But I told you at the beginning of the talk that we know exactly the amount of visible matter, dark matter, and dark energy in the universe. And that's the most amazing measurement I've ever seen, done by the Planck experiment from the European Space Agency that was done, I think, in 2013 or something like that. I'm not exactly sure. But let me show you how they did that. It's, it's brilliant. To answer it, we have to go back a little bit in time. We have to go back, in fact, to the origin of the universe, the Big Bang. So you know that there was this massive explosion. And at the beginning of the uh, universe, there was uh, this explosion. We don't know where it comes from. We just know it happened. Then there was this rapid uh, inflation where the dimensions of the universe grew faster sorry, than the speed of light. There was no information, no, ma no matter, it was just information, but the size of the universe, the, uh, of the universe grew faster than the speed of light. So there's this uh, short period of inflation that lasted 10 to the minus 32 seconds. So if you don't know, uh, uh, not familiar with this, it's 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. So you have 32 decimal points you move uh, the decimal point by 32 positions, and that's 10 to the min uh, minus 32 seconds. And it took a while before there was so much energy. It was like a huge soup uh, full, full of quarks and um, photons and phonons and, uh, and uh, gluons and I don't know what. And it took a while before the quarks, all that could cool down enough that quarks could form. And then, uh, not quarks, but pro protons could form with three quarks. And much later, at one hundredth of a second, so it took a one hundredth of a second before the, there was a nuclear fusion taking place. And finally, the nuclear uh, fusion ends about three minutes after the beginning of the universe. But the important date in the history of the universe is 380,000 years after the birth of the universe, when finally, uh, neutral atoms, hydrogen atoms were formed, 
And then it was about around 5,000 degrees uh, Kelvin, I think. And so that's a very important time because if you have free electrons, they're going to scatter light. So light cannot propagate freely. But as soon as you have neutral atoms that are forming, then you don't have all these uh, electric uh, charges uh, loose everywhere, scattering the light. And the light can propagate without being blocked. So the light can pr propagate freely. The weird thing is that this light is still traveling today. And this light, when it, start, when it was emitted at 380,000 years after the Big Bang, so very early in the uh, history of the universe, when this light was emitted, it was visible light at the time because it, it was about 5,000 degrees and it's something that corresponds to visible light. But today, this light that still uh, is there has been, because the universe has increased, you can look at it that the wave that were inside, it's like a, a slinky uh, uh, spring and you're just stretching them. So light that was in the visible domain today is in the microwave, microwave regime. So those, those uh, waves have been uh, stretched or just because it's colder now in the universe, the universe has expanded, all the heat that was in it has uh, scattered, has uh, filled a larger volume, and so it's not so hot anymore. And so the, what started as light, it's still traveling today in the form of microwave. So the wave that we had that were corresponding to uh, visible light, today have been stretched and it corresponds to microwave. How could it be that light that started more than 13 billion years ago, 13 billion years ago, this light started propagating. How come it has not, it's still going on? The reason is very simple, is that there is essentially nothing in the universe. The density of the universe is about one proton per cubic meter. So one cubic meter, one proton. That's the average density of matter in the universe. So if I was to take the universe, which is uh, something like 9 billion light years in diameter, and I was to compress it to until I reach the density of water, I would end up with a pancake of a few millimeter to get the density of water. Okay, so the universe is huge, it contains a lot of matter, but the overall density is one proton per, met, per cubic meter. So all this to say that when light propagates in the, in the universe, it's nearly empty. So light that started uh, propagating very early on is still going on today, except that it was, it's no longer visible light, it's microwave. And this was discovered in the 50s that if you were to take a microwave antenna and point it anywhere in any direction in the, in the universe, you would get this background, this noise in the microwave uh, regime. Today we call it the cosmological microwave background. And that's, if you, if you were to, uh, to make a picture, and that's what the Planck experiment did, the Planck satellite did, they collected this microwave uh, background and they made a picture of where it was coming from in the universe. And on the vertical axis here, what you have is uh, variations in temperature, which are shown in the, no, uh, the variation in temperature are shown by the difference in colors. And you can see that there are all sorts of lumps in that. It's not uniform. Okay. What they did, the Planck, uh, the group of people working on the Planck experiment, they look at this picture here and they, count, they looked at all the variations in temperature, which you put on the vertical axis here, on the vertical axis, and they look at the size of the object, the size of the lumps of various colors, and they, they counted how many of those objects they had. And they saw that uh, the red po uh, points here are their uh, experimental data. And you see, as you go away here, they have fewer large structures 
and you see that the error margins, the error bars are larger. But here it's quite precise because they find lots of very tiny structures in this picture. So what we have here, this picture, is the oldest picture that we have of the universe when it was a baby universe of 380,000 uh, years old. They make this weird picture showing the size of all structures observed in the universe and the temperature fluctuations in micro degree Kelvin. And you see there is also a green curve. And this green curve corresponds to the theoretical model that they drew to reproduce this curve. And you see that it fits perfectly. The agreement between the green curve and the red points is just amazing. It's, it's no wonder because they cheated completely to do that. They have a model with six free parameters and they adjusted all those parameters until it fitted perfectly on the curve. So they have a model to explain how the universe evolved, which contains different parameters like dark matter, dark energy, uh, the, the, the amount of uh, visible matter, the age of the universe, and two other weird uh, parameters. But they can adjust those parameters and it fits perfectly with what they observe on this picture here. And from that, they could deduce the density of dark matter and the density of dark energy. And that's how they got the 27% and the 68%. So what they did, what they saw is that to make a universe, it's just like to make a cake. You need six ingredients. To make a cake, you need eggs, flour, butter, milk, a pinch of salt, and the most important ingredient is the raising agent, which is either yeast or a baking powder. If you don't have that, your universe will not grow. And so that's what they had. They realized that without the dark matter, the universe would not have developed to be like we see it today. So it's the equivalent to the baking powder. If we compare the, the age of the universe with a 100 year old person, if we were to say that our universe is like a 100 year old person, so the Big Bang marks the birthday of this person. 13.8 billion years, it's the actual age of our uh, universe. So a hundred year old uh, person, uh, that would be that. So 380,000 uh, years for the universe. How many day, uh, how old is the, the, uh, the person at 380,000 years? So we have to calculate so, uh, and you get that it's a one day old person. So this image that we have now, cosmologists take this picture. It's like the picture of a one day old universe. And you try to imagine how it got to look like this when it was a hundred years old. Just like you were to take the picture of a baby, one day old, that's one. And you try to imagine what he would look like, like a, when he is a hundred years old. And that's what they did. The question in cosmology is to understand how the universe evolved. At the beginning, it was just a big uniform fog of free particles. And when we look at the sky to, uh, today, or tonight, we see tons of stars and galaxies and uh, quasars and uh, pulsars and I don't know what. So how did it move from being a fog to being something full of lumps. And if you look at this picture, already at the beginning, this, uh, when the universe was just one day old, it was already full of lumps. Now this here is just uh, the background from uh, being at the level of the Earth. But here is what the Planck satellite did. They collected the light and they have this image of a one day old universe and they tried to predict how we can get to what it looks like today when it's 100 years old. So what they did, they collect this light and they formed the picture that I showed you uh, earlier from the cosmological uh, microwave background. They get the curve, then they have a model. They put the six ingredients that they have to make a universe 
and they let it evolve and it spin and it spin on a computer simulation. And they do that for a few weeks or a few months, I'm not too sure. And they see that slowly structures start to appear. It starts to be um, with filaments in it. And when it was about one half a billion years today, and today it would look like this. Now, like this would be the picture at the very bottom here. But that's not what we see when we look at the sky. Yeah? So the, the, here, that would be about 3.2 billion light years here, the three centimeters that I'm showing here. Now, if I just take a square here and enlarge it four times bigger, then I see structures in it. And again, I take, I take a, a piece here, I enlarge it, and I get this picture. I take another square and I enlarge it and then whoops, here I have a galaxy at the center and all sorts of filaments. And then if I enlarge again, four times bigger, I get to something that looks like a picture that the Hubble telescope could uh, send us. So you see their model is right. To, by cos with cosmology, we can see now that dark matter and dark energy are essential ingredients to make the universe today. Without dark matter, visible matter would not have been able to aggregate and form stars and galaxies like it did. The dark matter does not respond to electromagnetic uh, forces and all that, so there is no repulsion. And so it was much easier for dark matter to start create little seeds where other uh, pieces of dark matter would come and aggregate due to uh, the gravitational force and make like a snowball effect. So we have our proofs for dark matter. We know that it's there because of its gravitational effects. We don't see the dark matter, but we can uh, verify it through this measurements of the rotational speeds of galaxies and also because of gravitational lensing. And I showed you another proof of dark matter coming from cosmology. First of all, we have this uh, cosmological uh, microwave background and from it, we can explain how galaxy formation uh, took place and how the universe evolved, okay? And the last topic, which will take me probably five or 10 minutes is how can we detect dark matter? So now we know it's there. We know it's a huge amount of matter and uh, also dark energy, but we have no idea what it is. And there are three ways particle physicists are looking for uh, dark matter. We call them direct searches. We look in cosmic rays and we also look at the Large Hadron Collider at CERN. That's what I was doing. The first one, direct searches. Those are, we put a detector somewhere and we hope that maybe a particle of dark matter will come, will hit a nucleus, a proton of a neutron in the, inside the nucleus, and then the nucleus will rec uh, recoil. So there will be a small vibration. That would be a phonon that we would be uh, detecting then, just a, uh, like a sound wave. So we're trying to see, we don't know, we don't know what kind of interaction it would make, we just know that it would induce a little vibration, a recoil from the nucleus. And so we're, we have built lots of uh, those uh, detectors, usually at the, uh, under huge mountains, like uh, there is uh, some of it uh, at the, um, in Italy that are built uh, oftentimes in tunnels under a mountain and they would put detectors there. We use a mountain as a shield to block all the cosmic rays coming from outer space. And we hope that the dark matter particle will come and maybe interact with one of a, a proton or a neutron in our detector. This has been going on for 20 years, that kind of search, and I don't know how many thousands of people have dedicated all their brain and research and all that on that, but so far we have not found anything. A second method is on board the International Space Station. There is an experiment currently uh, ongoing, the AMS-2 uh, experiment, and it's, um, 
it has been observed in cosmic rays that we see way more um, positron coming from outer space. Positrons are the, the um, you know, antimatter of electrons. So they are positive electrons. We, there are lots of sources of electrons in the, in the universe, but positrons, because our, our the universe is made of uh, matter, anything that produces dark matter and not dark, sorry, uh, antimatter is a bit more uh, rare. So there are two main hypotheses for where would the positron come from. One source could be from pulsars or neutron stars. And the other one, which is the one that I'm interested in, would be that two particles of uh, dark matter, which we call the, we represent here by the, the symbol chi, from the Greek symbol chi. So two particles of dark matter could interact somehow, maybe exchange an electron, and they would produce a pair of electron and positron. And that would be a source of positron, uh, a possible source of positron. So this experiment on board the International Space Station, what they're trying to do, they calculate here on this uh, axis, they calculate how many positrons they see the flux of positron with respect to the flux of positron and electrons. So the number of positrons that we see and the energy that those uh, positrons have. And they see a lot of uh, with uh, small energy, but very few with high energy. And that's where it becomes interesting. So if it was to come from pulsars, theorists tell us that the distribution would be along this curve, the solid line. And you see the crosses that we have here are experimental measurements with their experimental errors there. The, and we, it's not clear, it looks like it's, uh, it's turning around here, but it's not really clear. So if it was to come from pulsars, it would look, it, sorry, it would look like, uh, like this, this curve. But if it was to come from dark matter, we would see at one point that it would start to come down. And AMS2 is trying to get a lot of data here in this regime to try to tell the difference between the two curves. But you can see that they're quite similar. They might never reach the, the sensibility that we need. But that's one, one shot in the dark, but it's a one experiment that there, uh, is ongoing. And it's been going on for several years. Uh, I've been here in Germany for six years. So it's been going on for probably for a good 10 years. They're still at it. And their data is still not uh, good enough, but we're hoping to have uh, some news eventually. So we still don't know what it is. And the I'm third, sorry, we could you uh, really quick comment on what the two data sets are, the red and the black one? Oh, uh, I can't remember now. The, the red, no, the black ones are the ones from AMS and they're the most precise. You see there, the error bars are smaller. Those were from, the, uh, from previous experiments. Here it's Pamela, it's called. This one is uh, from the, they're at Stanford University. Uh, I forget their name now, but they are different experiments that have been making measurement. And it's only this uh, with uh, the AMS experiment that they have enough sensitivity to really explore this uh, high energy regime. And that's where we can tell the difference between this curve here in blue or the one here in black, which would be uh, from a dark matter. Thank you very much. Okay. And the third thing is from CERN uh, the, at the Large Hadron Collider where I work. So the Large Hadron Collider is this huge uh, accelerator, 27 kilometer across. It's underground at a hundred meter underground. And there are four large experiments that have been placed at the bottom of uh, tunnels there. I was working on the Atlas experiment. And what they do there, uh, whoops, I should, sorry. Uh, okay, I'll go here. So what they do there, we have this huge accelerator and they have protons going in one direction, protons coming in the other one, and they go at the speed of light and they try to bring them in collision to create something new. So here is how it goes. Uh, 
So the protons are first accelerated in a small uh, circular accelerator and then a larger one. They're all recycling all the accelerators that they had. Then in this one called the SPS, which is seven kilometers across. And when they reach the proper energy, then protons go circulating in two different directions. And eventually they bring those protons inside the tunnel here, inside this vacuum tube, they bring the protons into collisions uh, at the center of the Atlas detector or one of the other detectors. So you see the protons are coming with the three quarks that make the protons in one and one is coming from the other direction. They come, they meet in the center of the detector, pure energy comes out of it and is released and will materialize into different things. And that's where we're looking at. We hope that maybe one of the things that can be produced would be dark matter. So to produce new particles with the Large Hadron Collider, we bring a huge amount of energy into a tiny point of space. And what we do, the energy release from, from uh, new particles. We simply take this equation from uh, Mileva Marichenstein and her husband, Albert Einstein, except that most people have not heard about Mileva Marich, but they did this work together. So they did this equation, they showed that there is an equivalence between energy and matter. So, and the, the conversion factor is the square of the speed of light. It's like I could have uh, uh, euros in my pocket and uh, Canadian dollars. And there is, so energy and matter has two form of the main, same essence, like two types of um, uh, money are the same, and there is a conversion factor between the two of them. So you can take the energy of the collision, produce new particles. Our detectors are huge, they are 4,000 kilometers. That's the Atlas uh, detector, the, just one part of it, the calorimeter, and it, it has 4,000 kilometers of cables and four kilometers of tubing with all sorts of uh, 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 cooling uh, liquids and all that. It weighs 7,000 tons, just like the Eiffel Tower. And it's, uh, but it's all made of ultra precise small components, all handmade. And it's uh, gigantic, it's uh, six story high, and it's not very easy to make a good selfie there, which is, uh, what this guy is trying to do. So it's a huge detector and it's made of several layers and we try to get information and get a picture of what happened. So we can produce dark matter, like I said earlier, with <clears throat> a particle of dark matter here coming, interacting with a quark from uh, our detector. And there is some interaction. We don't know exactly how it would work. And it would just be recoiling uh, the, the Nucleus would recoil and the other one escapes. But we could also turn this diagram around 90 degree and then you take two quarks from two protons that are coming, they interact and of there come two uh, dark matter, uh, two particles of dark matter. But it's not easy, we, take, we have billions of collisions like that, that we've taken pictures, recorded them we take pictures like maniac, like a tourist on vacation, and then we have to sort them out. And when we take those pictures, it's like I'm asking you, you know, here's uh, thousands of people in the crowd and I'm asking you, have you seen my uh, cousin? And I don't even tell you, you know, how old she is, what she's uh, wearing, uh, what she looks like, is she tall, is she uh, big? Uh, we know nothing. So we're looking for something, but we don't know what we are looking for. So it's really difficult. So we try all sorts of possibilities. And essentially how we look for them, we look for a type of events, a picture of those events. Normally we always see things that are produced and recoil against each other like this. So we have jets of particle going in two, two uh, directions. But one thing that would be a sign of dark matter would be a jet of visible particle going at one o'clock here and nothing recoiling in the other direction because it's invisible to our detector. This matter is not going to interact with our detector and it will look like 
I'm pushing against an invisible wall or something like that. If you, you need to be, to produce something back to back. If it's exposed, uh, like in a firework, you always see things going in all directions. So that would be the same thing. So we look for things like that. We looked at billions of events. We haven't found anything. Uh, see the, the missing uh, particles would be recoiling against the other one. Or another way to look at it is to look for type of events that are very well known. For example, type of events where we find two photons. And we look at the energy of the combined two photons and we have uh, theoretical predictions for those, what it would look like. It would be this red curve. And we look for something that we ought to say, something unusual, uh, a bump in the curve. Instead of our data following exactly this curve, maybe we will sign find an excess of events. If you subtract here the, the red curve from the bump, then you can better see the bump. And so we sometimes we find something that looks like an excess, but when you look more carefully, then you realize that it's not really there. I see it's pretty dark. Should turn on the light, sorry. And so, but we haven't found anything that is really out of the ordinary. We're always looking at various things like that and then woof, they disappear. So we have nothing solid yet, but there are good chances to find something soon, or we hope so. And uh, there are several experiments uh, underground in mines or, there, or, or the, under the mountains. We have also uh, the AMS experiment uh, on the International Space Station looking at cosmic rays. And we're looking for unusual things uh, at the LHC. We're looking at lots of data and they're going to go at a higher energy. So we've been at it for the 10 years now. So we keep going for another 20 years, I think. Maybe we find something. Okay, thanks for your uh, attention. And if you want to know more about it, so there is my book, a popular uh, book that talks more about the particle physics than the astronomy, but you'll find everything about uh, particle physics. And it also comes in, uh, in German now with a different title, but same author. So, was kommt nach dem Higgs boson? Teilchen physik, Large Hadron Collider, and CERN verständlich gemacht. Okay, so thank you very much. And uh, we, oh, sorry, it's been a bit longer, but we still have time for questions. Okay, thank you very much, Pauline. Let's thank the speaker, everybody. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. So, yes, if it's all right for everybody, and we are 36 people, by the way, so welcome everybody who joined in. Pretty uh, it's pretty cool to see so many people interested in physics and then we will um, we will take the, the the last five minutes of the break for Pauline to answer questions if this is all right with everybody and if we make one minute longer maybe that's uh, also all right with the second speaker so I have a few questions already um, asked and uh, Alban the first uh, was of you maybe you will ask it yourself yeah, I was wondering when you showed the baby universe, how did they know that it was stopping there and that there was nothing after? How did they get this full picture of the, of the universe? Okay. Uh, that would be long. Okay, so I told you that when the universe was about 280,000 years old, then it became transparent to light because it was neutral atoms that were around and no longer free electrons that would scatter light. Okay, so light can propagate freely after this, this date, which corresponds to one day for a person. And so this light was visible light, okay? And the waves, uh, the wavelengths here correspond to visible light, or I should uh, use the pointer. And then this light, because it's in the universe and the universe kept expanding, then those waves are also being stretched. They're no longer 
in the visible light, but they are turned into microwave lights. Okay, on the, this is the electromagnetic spectrum. And the only difference between gamma rays, X-rays, uh, visible light, infrared, and microwave, microwave is just the wavelength, okay? And so those are similar wave, except that they don't have the same wavelength. So now what started as visible light is now turned into a microwave. They pointed an antenna on the satellite, the Planck satellite, they pointed an antenna in all directions, collected all those microwave that they could hear, okay? And like this film showed, and they made, uh, they just swept the sky with their uh, antenna and they collected all the microwave and built that, that image. So this corresponds to our picture of a baby. And so now this is the oldest picture in the family album of the universe, okay? So we know what the universe looked like when it was a baby. We also know what it looks like today. And they're trying to bridge it, bridge the, the gap, to try to understand how it evolved from looking like this cute little thing and this old uh, wrinkled thing, okay? Uh, and so for that, they do a simulation. And that's the simulation that we see here. They, so they start with the earliest picture that we have of the universe. So that's our starting point, time zero. And we look at today, time t. And then we let things evolve. So they, they started with, I don't know how many million particles that they injected in their model. And they put all the, those uh, parameters on their model. And then it was just growing and growing, just like you're looking at your cake rising and watching where everything goes. And you know, at the end, your cake, you have all sorts of bubbles of air in it and the filaments. And that's what you see here too. And so they can tell that their model that they have to explain how we went from what it looked like as a baby universe and what it looks like today works. And so we know that there is 27% dark matter, 68% dark energy, 5% visible matter. Okay, thank you very much, Pauline. We have two more questions, if you can answer quickly. Yes, we I know. appreciate this one you, you do. Oh, Otherwise, I, I, we can answer them after the second talk, but okay. maybe we, we can try. Laura, yours is the next question. May you ask it yourself? Uh, maybe you're uh, muted. It would be easy yeah. to answer. Okay, otherwise I will ask a quick she, she was interested in um, how much energy by the, those protons collisions you model, uh, you actually did in turn, uh, how much energy is released and whether it can be dangerous in any way for anybody. On the yeah, scale, sorry, the internet just, just went off. <laughs> but yeah, okay. that was my question. On the scale, on the scale, our scale, uh, our, it would be the equivalent of two uh, mosquitoes hitting each other in full flight. So that's the amount of energy that is released. It corresponds to two mosquitoes hitting each other when they fly at one meter per second or something like that. So it's a ridiculous amount of energy for us. But for tiny particles like a proton, then it's a huge amount of energy. So it's just a question of scale. But on our uh, scale, macroscopic scale, it's, it, it's the equivalent of two mosquitoes hitting each other uh, in flight. And how, how long can you keep this energy? Is there... Uh, the beam circulates, uh, no, it can go from uh, a few seconds when they are unlucky and everything uh, uh, traps on you. You know, this tons of things that can go wrong. Or sometimes they can maintain them uh, circulating for about 12 hours. But at the end, there are less protons left in the machine and then it's not worth it and they, they refill the machine and they restart again. But we can go, uh, on a good day, they could go eight, 12 hours. But they've been doing it now for 10 okay, years. Thank you. Yeah. 
Okay, Pauline, one quick question to you. Will you be available for questions after the second talk as well? Will you hang around or do you have somewhere yeah. to be? Oh, I'll go and get my beer now and uh, hang around. Okay, so thank you very much.